science and a little bit about what we do. So Linda is off the hook for uh, doing that twice. <laughs> um, so I'm Stephanie Palmer. I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Physics. I also have a joint appointment in the Department of Organismal Biology and Anatomy. And nobody knows what that means, so don't worry if you don't. Uh, and what I want to talk to you about today is how I got here, starting in condensed matter theory and now doing neuroscience, and uh, what, how a physicist approach, approaches problems in neuroscience. And it is not theorist to clock right now, so I'm going to warm up with you, but if I'm goofy for a little while, it's because I'm still half asleep. But um, all right, so I put this up on the board as a little teaser. Prediction is hard, especially about the future. Does anybody know who might have famously said that? Any ideas? Yogi Berra. OK, a lot of people, it's a, it sounds like a Yogi Berra quote, but that might be, um, that might be too old for this crowd. Um, it's also been attributed to Niels Bohr. It's also been attributed to an inventor, um, uh, Piet Hein and to uh, a Danish politician, uh, Carl Steinke. And what uh, Niels Bohr, Piet Hein, and Steinke all have in common is that they're all Danish. And it turns out that it's an old Danish saying. So nobody really said it first, except the collective Danish sort of ethos uh, came up with this idea. Prediction is hard, especially about the future. So our research in my group aims to tackle the problem about how brains make predictions. And we use tools. Um, from statistical physics and information theory to do that. And so the physicists in our group are basically solving physics problems that are dressed up in biology, and the biologists are solving biology problems that we dress up in physics. Um, I want to tell you how I got here, because prediction is hard for biological systems to do. It's also hard for us to do about ourselves and to know how we're going to get where we're going and whether or not we should make a change and what twists and turns will lead us to our ultimate goal, which in my mind, my goal in my career has been to find a good intersection between the things that I'm passionate about and the things that I'm talented at. Because there are things that I am wickedly passionate about, but I just plain old suck at them. Mm -hmm. And like singing, I love it. I want to do it all the time. I have friends who actually can sing, and they tell me to stop. So <laughs> what, <laughs> what I have done um, is to try to figure out what I really, really love and what will um, get me up in the morning and keep me up at night thinking and, and, and humming along about, but also things that, that, I, that I know I'm good at, so I'm not uh, facing like an uphill struggle. Um, and I want to talk to you first about some of the uh, people along the way who showed me their own paths and how they got there. So this, this woman um, is uh, Mary Jane Morrison. Um, that was her maiden name. Her uh, married name was Palmer. And she had a BS in physics from the University of Chicago in 1941. Now, the University of Chicago was an unusual place in that it accepted women at that time and didn't have a separate college for them. Everybody went to the University of Chicago. Um, this was the Hutchins era, so this was where everyone was also supposed to learn Greek and Latin and read the classic texts as part of their education, even if they were in physics. Um, but still, it was unusual for a woman to be majoring in physics and graduating in 1941. And after Mary Jane graduated, she got two telegrams, one uh, from Washington, D.C., and one from New Jersey, to join the war effort. And one was to work on code breaking, and that was in DC. And one was to work on ultra high frequency uh, radio techniques, and that was in New Jersey. She went to uh, Washington first, found it creepy, asked if she could leave. They said, sure, you haven't learned enough yet. Um, they let her go to New Jersey, where she was sent to Princeton to learn um, techniques, and then sent to the naval um, base in Red Bank, New Jersey, to work during the war. Um, and she, she worked all throughout the war um, effort then as, uh, as a physicist and basically doing um, what we would call applied math. Uh, and she, has, uh, really, she had really wonderful stories about trying to get Einstein to come out and say hi to her and some of the other young women who were in Princeton at the time uh, to get gathered together because basically the nation had said, we need people. So let's get the women in on this, too. <laughs> and uh, so there were a collection of really um, brilliant and fantastic young uh, mathematically minded women in Princeton at the time. But they didn't get Einstein to come out and chat with them. I don't know why, but she said they, they couldn't convince him. Uh, and after, after the war, uh, she uh, got married and had a kid. That kid turned out to be my dad. 
So I could give you a really um, sort of clean story about how she was a physicist, then my dad was a physicist, so that's why I'm a physicist, but that would be a lie. And I want to tell you about why, because I think it's interesting, and it's interesting about our paths. So after the war, um, she had two kids, and she, was, she became kind of a housewife. She left science after doing this fantastic, cutting edge, like NASA, national security level research during World War II. Um, and she became kind of your regular domestic housewife, except there is no such thing as a regular domestic housewife. Um, and she was bored. So she started uh, entering contests for jingles, essay contests, anything that would um, that could give a payoff and exercise her mind at the same time, because it turned out that the, my grandfather, may he rest in peace, was a bit of a failed uh, engineer, and he didn't make a lot of money. So my grandma made a lot of money, <laughs> winning, uh, winning boats and trips to the Bahamas that she then would pose for the picture in the newspaper. And I have newspaper clippings that say, Mrs. Robert Palmer wins again. Um, <laughs> and yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but then she'd sell everything, and she, f she basically funded the family uh, during that time uh, to, in, in a significant amount. Um, she found her career that I knew her as later in life when she became head of the Warren branch of the Detroit Public Library, and she ran um, their children's programs and designed puppets and created plays and ran programs and was... Um, that, you know, sort of in charge of, of the library when, when libraries were still a thing, if that makes sense, um, a hub for, for the community to come in and learn. And, and she had an encyclopedic knowledge of all kinds of things. So when I was growing up, I thought of her as a librarian and as an artist. She painted and she did some sculpture. Um, so I had no idea about this part of her life when this is, this is from around 1945 or 46, just after the war, this photo. Um, and when I went to college, I thought I would be a pre-med because I wanted to be a brain surgeon because, you know, that sounded hard. Um, and I liked gooey, gunky stuff. Um, I realized I didn't like pre-med classes during my first year, so I started taking physics. And I got really excited about it. Uh, and I told my grandma that I was going to switch and become a major, I was going to major in chemistry and physics at Michigan State. And she said, oh, that's great. I should give you some of my notes. And I said... <laughs> What notes? She said, my physics notes. And I said, physics from where? <laughs> and, then she, and then all of a sudden, it turned out that my grandmother had studied physics. And after she had come back to the University of Chicago to visit after the war, she had run into all kinds of people. She had met Oppenheimer when she was still here. She met Fermi after she came back. She had, this, uh, she had wonderful stories about this part of her life that I had absolutely no idea about it. Um, I have to say that uh, I think she found a really wonderful career um, outside of physics, uh, but that stayed with her, that physics training stayed with her. And um, I think it is reflected in just the story she would tell me and how she, how she saw the world. So um, Mary Jane, uh, my grandma, was a, was a huge inspiration to me as a person, and it turns out she was also a physicist. Um, Another person who inspired me along the way was this woman, um, Alison Dope. Alison uh, went to get her MD, PhD at Harvard. And uh, she, uh, she, so she was an MD at Harvard. And she was studying psychiatry. That was going to be her specialty. She went off to Caltech and did her PhD with Konishi. And Konishi, at that time, was working on, or his career, uh, was working on birdsong research. So he was studying how songbirds learn their song. And she became interested in the intersection between neuroscience and psychiatry. And she was at the University of California in San Francisco um, when I was looking for postdocs. And she is the one who, um, when I read about her work and talked with her, I decided to switch from physics into neuroscience. So back to, back to my path for a second. So I go to college. I talk to my grandma. She's got notes on um, thermodynamics and things that I should read. Um, I'm studying physics. I go and do my PhD in condensed matter theory because that is just super, super fun. And my research was on finding uh, magnetic ordering patterns in geometrically frustrated antiferromagnets. Mouthful. The basic idea is that if you put uh, two, if you put up two spins and they want to be antiparallel to each other, they do this. If you put a third one in, it doesn't know what to do. It can satisfy this bond, but then it then it's 
parallel with this one, or it can satisfy this one, and then it's frustrated with this one. So you, you imagine making a macroscopic lattice out of triangles, and you have a lot of frustration, quote unquote frustration. Um, Say it's not a masculinist discourse, but whatever. All right, so these spins are frustrated. Um, and if they're frustrated, it means that no matter which way I put this one, they have an equal sort of energy cost to that. And if you have a macroscopic number of those, that means you can wind up with a macroscopic uh, degeneracy in your ground state. And so that's why geometrically frustrated antiferromagnets are fun, because they can have these highly degenerate ground states without any disorder. And then you, what your job, if you're a theorist working on this, is to figure out what sort of interaction will break that symmetry and make them order. Um, so we did that uh, with John Talker when I was a graduate student at Oxford. It was a ton of fun. I absolutely loved it. I was having a great time. It turns out years later we found out we got it right, and that uh, ordering pattern get, got our name, and my grandma was super pleased with that. So it's the Palmer Chucker phase. Um, and. Uh, she was, she was really happy that we got Palmer into the literature um, in physics, with woman's name on it. Um, but when I was thinking about what I wanted to do next and applying for postdocs, I could see basically the projects I would work on for postdoc and what I would work on for faculty. And I thought, OK, I could, I could see clearly what I was going to do. Um, but I had some friends who were working on neuroscience, and they suggested I apply to this program at the University of California, San Francisco, where Allison was working at the time and was a prof there. And it was a Sloan Schwartz Fellowship to pull uh, physicists and mathematicians into neuroscience and to basically uh, retrain you uh, with a free kind of three years of time to learn neuroscience and then move on and do research. And I jumped at that because of the research that Allison was doing. And let me tell you a little bit about why and how hard that transition was. <laughs> so Allison was working on what happens to your brain as you age that limits your ability to learn new things with the same facility. So does anybody here speak more than one language? Awesome. How many people learned it as a kid? Great. Um, do you have an accent in that other language? No. Right. Um, does any, well, maybe a little bit. Depends on what year you learned the second language. After age 12, you kind of can't shake a bit of an accent in the second language. Um, how many people here speak another language but learned it late in life? That's like me. I have a really strong accent in French or German. Sometimes I sound like I'm, I have a French accent in German. <laughs> but it's all sort of detectably American at some level. Um, and that's because there are things that happen in your brain um, that, that limit your ability to learn new things the same way you did as a kid. And uh, there are brain areas that are specialized for our language, uh, like Broca's area. And when you learn a, a language later in life, it gets localized to a completely different part of your brain. So um, Allison was working on that. Allison Dope was working on that in songbirds and asking, do songbirds have a similar kind of critical period for learning their song? And it turns out that they do. And she was studying what opens and closes that critical period. And as a physicist, I was fascinated by this. Because it turns out it's not some you know, biology thing. It's not like, oh, at this age, this hormone turns on, and then no more language learning for you. Or no more language learning with the same ease. And it's not like, oh, this age comes on, and your muscles in your larynx have gotten tired. And you can't do it anymore. Or your brain has gotten, you know, your brain has basically atrophied and you can't do it anymore. You can still learn tons of stuff. It's just that you learn them in a different way. And I was fascinated by that. I wanted to understand the dynamics of learning. And I thought, this is so exciting and so fundamental. It's like physics. It's like a frontier of knowledge where we know absolutely nothing so far, but we're trying to discover how stuff works. And I thought, well, this is great. And maybe the concepts from condensed matter physics will help with this. Maybe the idea that a single electron doesn't superconduct. Right? It's a collective effect. Maybe that's going to be important in the brain, too, because single neurons don't learn languages. Right? Your whole brain. So there was a bit of arrogance to me at that time to think, OK, I can do this. I can go switch. And it was a hard transition when I, I did a lot of, I spent a lot of time in my postdoc. I was first at UCSF with Allison and then moved to Princeton um, and worked with Bill Bialik and Michael Berry um, on the stuff that I'm going to talk to you about today. 
Um, and I had, a, I had a lot to learn. And basically what I had to learn was how to have taste in biology, how to pick problems where a physics approach was appropriate, solvable, and could make experimentally testable predictions. So I want to show you how you do that from a physics perspective today. Um, and then we'll, we'll see where we are and we'll see if we, we, maybe we'll tell some more stories at the end, okay? All right, so here's a sort of uh, pop science title about what I work on, seeing what's coming, how your brain, particularly your visual system, makes predictions. So when physicists approach biology, they often ask about optimality. They ask about how could this biological system be as good as the stuff that I have in, that I can order from DigiKey, right? How can, I, how can I make this operate at the physical limits of, of you know, that particular sensor? Um, and that's uh, the way that uh, physicists generally solve that is they say, well, I want to maximize the information transmission, say, between the outside world and this biological sensor, um, subject to um, constraints. And maybe the only constraints I want to think about as a physicist are the physical limits of sensation, like how, you know, what's the bandwidth? How many, how many wires do I have, effective wires do I have in the system? Um, and physicists have been fairly successful at finding biological systems that seem to be optimal, where um, you know, it, it looks like uh, visual systems can detect light down to the kind of shot noise limit of the receptors in your eye. Um, and, it's, and, it's, and it's a wonderful story. Um, but it's a little bit intimidating because you have to know where in the vast array of organisms and vast array of problems that biological, these biological organisms solve, which ones are sitting at physical limits where I could write down an equation that I could solve that would tell me how to understand their behavior. Um, so what we want to do is to make this a little bit broader so we can understand optimality, you know, sort of in the in sort of meeting the organism where it lives, you know, where are they in evolutionary time? And it doesn't matter for a particular paramecium to be the best, you know, sniffer of, of food uh, that it could possibly be. It just has to be better than its competitors. And it just has to be enough for it to survive. So, we, so, uh, so the biology perspective forces us to add in behavioral goals into those constraints. So we, ha we come at it as a physicist and we say we want to understand is this system optimized? We want to understand if it's optimized up to the, its physical limits, but then we also have to think about what matters to that organism. What, are it, what is its behavioral goal? The work we're doing recently tries to add in this constraint, which is the fact that you don't get to build, you don't get to build a brain de novo. It has to evolve from the brain it was before and the brain it was before that. And recent work on butterfly evolution and their visual systems has taught us that you can see potentially shadows of your ancestral history in the way that you make computation. So today I'm going to talk to you about adding in behavioral goals to, to these constraints. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, what does the brain think about when it thinks about the future? Because the behavioral goal I'm going to talk about is being able to uh, make predictions about what will happen next. And to motivate that, uh, we're going to do a little bit of uh, group participation. So another way to ask this question that's a little bit more technical, is the brain's compression algorithm optimized for prediction? Physicists have been thinking about this for a while. Um, this is von Neumann. And von Neumann wrote, um, there is one important difference between ordinary logic and the automata which represent it. Time never occurs in logic, but every network or nervous system has a definite time lag between the input signal and the response. So what this means is that if I was ordering parts to build a computer, and somebody sent me a bunch of neurons, they would have these really long lags, like up to a millisecond between their input and output. And if I ordered those from DigiKey and got them, I would send them back immediately. They are they they totally crappy. And they'd say, why did you send me these horrible, these horrible parts? They have a lag. They have lags. But that's how biological systems work, and brains have to deal with that. And why, is it important? why would it be important for a brain to compensate for lag? Well, if there's a lag, it means that what's happening now inside your brain is way behind what's happening now in the outside world. So if you're, Serena, trying to hit this tennis ball, and say you just have a modest lag of 50 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 
Not even a half, of, it's, a, it's a tenth of a half of a second, right? If the ball is moving at 60 miles per hour, that 50 millisecond lag is more than a meter, all right? And we know that we can all get our racket on a tennis ball no matter how bad we are at tennis. You can, you can, you can get it, you just can't put it where you want. <laughs> at least that's my problem. I usually put it somewhere very far away. Um, if you look at professional tennis players, you'll see that Serena's not just looking at where the ball is, she's actually looking at where the ball will be. This is where the ball lives in her brain if she doesn't compensate for lag. And what's amazing is that humans can demonstrably compensate for that. So you have to be able to do that if you want to make meaningful interactions with your environment. And that's what my group studies, basically how the heck do brains make predictions. OK, so we're going to do um, a demonstration of this. So I need everybody to participate with me because we're, we're going we're to look at this experiment as a group and report what we see. So what I want you to do is to, to stare at the center circle. Then this bar is going to start moving. Another bar is going to flash. And I want you to tell me if you see it ahead of this bar or behind this bar. The flash bar, I want you to tell me if it's ahead or behind. So stare at the center dot and keep your eyes on the center dot, and then the movie's going to go. OK. Was it everybody? Was it ahead? Was it behind? OK. Was it other? Anybody have other? What did you see? It was, it was the same, same, same line? OK, so same. OK, so it's either behind or same. Great. Anybody else? Any other experience? OK, we're going to try it a little bit faster. Everybody ready to stare at the center? OK, how about now? Still the same? Behind? How many behind? Everybody behind. Anybody bent? Bent, yeah, angled, like it's coming off the tip. Cool, OK. That's what I see when I look at the fast one, too. Um, so now I'm going to show this to you slowed down. And this is, this is a real movie that's not a trick of you know, how, the, how the keynote works or how the presentation. So this is, this is what's actually happening. So the flash is in line with the moving bar. And the reason your brain sees the flash bar behind is because your brain sees the continuous motion and is prospecting that forward. The reason you see it angled is that your visual system drags other parts of the visual scene along with it. So it's prospecting forward the things that happen near the tip of the bar and not the stuff that's happening further away. So you see it actually angled back sometimes. So your, your brain is, is giving you this illusion that is indicative of the predictions that it's making. You sort of just diagnosed the fact that all of your brains are making predictions. Now maybe it a little differently because everybody sees this slightly differently, but we're but we're all getting getting that out. So what my group tries to do is to say, okay, how do we turn this into a mathematical problem that we can solve that relates to biology? So what we do is we're trying to add a computational goal to encoding. So we're saying, say, this is an abstract representation of some visual stimulus that's coming in. And that's the past. And here is our present uh, firing or not firing of many neurons in our brain, in our visual system. So I'm going to represent firing with a 1 and not firing with a 0. And that's the current brain, you know, sort of what neurons are on when this stimulus came in. And we want to know, how does this representation let us predict the future? of the visual stimulus we're going to see. And these ones and zeros, uh, just for the um, condensed matter people out there who are interested in condensed matter, um, I turn, we, we often turn them into ones and zeros because it turns out that information transmission in neurons is really binary. It's whether, a, it's whether an electrical signal happens or not, not its amplitude. And that lets us think of them as binary things, like happened or not. That lets us reformulate them in terms of like, spin systems or Ising models. And it's not just fake, it's real. We can, we can say, if I think about the response states of my retina, I really can think of, about them in an Ising model and solve for interaction parameters and stuff like that. So that's fun. So now we want to turn this into a math problem. 
So we're going to write down this uh, Lagrangian. So we're going to say that we want to minimize the information we have about the past between the uh, stimulus that happened in the past and our present, I'm calling it W for word, binary word, at time t, um, subject to the constraint that we retain beta amount of information about the future. So I want to throw away information about the past. I'm taking in this massive amount of information about the world, and I'm compressing it. But I'm compressing it subject to the constraint that I'm saving what I want to know about the future. So that is the, how we, as physicists, have just written down that behavioral goal of prediction. And it has a weight, beta. And I've said information here, and that's information theory, as first put forward by Claude Shannon back in the day for communications network. So statistical stuff and physics and engineering all come into that. Um, and it's the same mathematical language. The mutual information between two variables is just a generalized form of their correlation. And you've all computed a correlation function, and that's just a two-point function. And information is all point function taken together. So it's simple. It sounds fancy, but it's simple. OK. So we can, it turns out that we can solve this problem analytically. And now we need to go and see if the brain does it. So we hypothesized that this computation starts as early as possible in your visual system. So it starts in your eye. And I don't know if you all know this, but your eyes are amazing. Your eyes aren't just photoreceptor detectors. They're not just cameras looking at the world. You have a piece of your central brain sitting in your eye. Developmentally, you've got you know, your peripheral nervous system, like the nerves in your hands and legs and stuff that let you sense the world, and your photoreceptors. And then you have central brain. Well, your eye has those photoreceptors plus the central brain smushed right on back of it. So that if we took a slice through an eyeball like that, where you know, here is your retina, that's the stuff that, trans that, that transduces photons into electrical signals. And we look at the cells that are there. Here's where the light comes in. Here are the photoreceptors. That's your peripheral nervous system. All the rest of this stuff is your, um, is your central nervous system. And the cables from these output cells, these purple cells, form your optic nerve. The cable that comes out of your eye is your optic nerve, and that's the axons or output wires from these cells. And that's basically all you have to know for what I'm going to tell you, is that there's a bunch of stuff that does computation. If your eye were just a camera, it'd be this with some wires. Instead, there's a lot going on. And it turns out that your eye is also you know, pretty nicely separated from the rest of your body. So if you're a very careful, basically, neurosurgeon, you can remove an eye from the rest of the body and keep it alive in a dish for about a day. And when people who have uh, eye diseases in particular donate their eyes to science, while the tissue is still alive, they can be recorded from, uh, which lends a lot to our understanding. But we don't do that in humans. We, um, when I was a postdoc, I did this in salamanders. And this is an easy experiment, so easy that a uh, theoretical physicist can do it. So I promise you we did not, we did not hurt, uh, we did not cause pain and suffering in the salamander. We did kill it, though. Um, but we, we, anest <laughs> we anesthetize it first, and then we put its retina in a dish. So biology is a little bit gruesome. Um, and so I, ha I have, oh gosh, I've just caused <laughs> We can, have a de we can definitely have a long discussion about the ethics of animal research. I am all on board for that. I have thought about it a lot. Um, this one recording gave us about three papers, so just so you know. Um, and now we work on butterflies and other insects, which we also anesthetize before we do anything to their eye. Um, so we take the retina out of the animal, we put it in a dish, and in this dish are embedded recording electrodes. So the green stuff is the output cells of the retina. The black, I'm going to do something, it's going to be a little, I'm going to turn off the lights just for a second. All right, okay. So now you can see a little better. So these are our recording electrodes. These blobs here are those output cells of the retina, and that's the cables. So these streaks are the cables from those cells that are all going to form your optic nerve. And they're streaming towards um, the part in your retina where they punch through, which is your blind spot. So those are the cells that sort of transmit the visual code to the brain. And that's the sum total of all the brain sees. And you'll notice that these electrodes are just about as dense as these cells. So when we get a good recording, we can see everything the brain sees electrically. 
And that's the real um, uh, magic and wonder of this kind of recording in, in, in biology. Of course, it's not magic, but you know, science is magic uh, in that way. Xerox machines are magic, as far as I'm concerned. Um, no, but the, the, wonder, the wonder is that this stuff works and that we've all contributed to discovering it. So there you go. All right, so now we have to, so we can record from the electrical signals from this piece of retina, and we've got the photoreceptors on the other side, and we can project a movie onto them so we can show this retina in a dish uh, scene. And we show them, we show it this scene. This is not very interesting. It's a jiggling bar. Um, you are all undergrads in physics, so you all know this equation. If this is the velocity of the bar um, and x is the position of the bar, this is a driven damped harmonic oscillator. This is what it's being driven with, and this gamma is noise. So this is a so stochastically driven damped harmonic, damped harmonic oscillator, OK? Good. So we all know that we could compute the damping coefficient for this thing, and we feel pretty comfortable that we could maybe do a calculation here. So that's just the position. That's the, that's the Gaussian that defines the position of the bar. So if you're used to Brownian motion, what this spring does, this fictive spring that tells us to the center of the screen, um, makes the position distribution stationary. The drag makes the um, velocity distribution stationary. So these two parts of this equation of motion are predictable. And this is stochastic. This is unpredictable. So what we have done is we have given the retina a motion stimulus that has a predictable and a non-predictable component. And what we're doing as theorists is we're asking, does the retina shrink down the non-predictable component to benefit the, the predictable component? And can we see that in the biology? So here's a cartoon of what we do, because I'm not going to take you through um, a couple you know, semesters of, well, a couple of years of work <laughs> that we did to solve all these equations. But um, we have a stimulus that's com coming in. The stimulus has its own correlations. And here are you know, the physicist's view of uh, neurons in the brain. They're just blobs. Um, this is the spherical horse approximation. Um, and here, here are the spikes from the retina. And we want to know how much this spiking in the retina says about the future of the stimulus. And it turns out we can solve that analytically. So here is the information that the retina has about the past. Here's what it has about the future. And this is verboten. Can't go there. But here is the bound on the maximal amount you could know about the future if you know this much about the past. And what we want to know is where does the retina sit? The retina can sit anywhere in this white region. And we hoped that the retina would be smushed up against the bound, doing, it, doing as best it could to represent the future, because we think the retina is participating in prediction. The retina's firing rates give us access to this part of the bound curve. So that's where we are. It's pretty linear here. Here's the information we have about the future. Here's the information we have about the past. That's cartooned here. And then we went and we recorded from the salamander retina. And we found that groups of single cells sit kind of here. And these, are, these cells sit over the bound not because they're violating, not because the, the, you know, there is no magic, right? They're, they're, the, that's just error bars in our estimation of what's there. Um, two cells, three cells, four cells, five cells, six cells. So we were very happy to see that groups of cells in the retina squish themselves pretty far against this bound. Actually, to the extent these error bars um, show us how accurate we are in measuring this information, because it's a hard calculation to do in a biological system. And basically, we're the, we are showing that the retina is within the error bars that we, that we have on measuring their response to being an optimal predictor of the future. So that was really, really satisfying. The first uh, piece of this result is what got me the job here. The rest of it is, you know, how I'm going to get promoted and all that stuff. But <laughs> um, this, is, this has been a really satisfying example. This retina is not optimal in terms of being an optimal physical device retaining everything about the visual scene. It doesn't. It compresses and it throws things away. And you can only understand how it works when you come back and you say, well, I'm a physicist, but I'm going to meet you, biological organism, where you live which is what are your important behavioral goals. And maybe those sculpt how you filter your sensory information. So adding in those behavioral goals let us do this. 
um, and show what the, what the biological system might actually be optimized for. So I'm going to end with a, because I should not go too far over time, though we started a little late. So I want to show you a neat movie about where we've taken this since, since then, because this is you know 2018, that's getting a little old. Um, so here's what we did next. We said, does this actually matter for behavior? Because I gave you this whole, like, you must think about behavior. You must think about what the organism is going to do with the information. So does it actually matter? So we started looking at this system. Um, all right, we're physicists. What is this? It's a fly. It's a regular old fly. And here it is. Here it is doing its fly thing. OK? And at some point, it's going to receive a threatening stimulus. And then it's going to try to escape. So there, it has, it has registered a threat, and it is turning rapidly away. OK. So rapidly, in quotes, OK. So <laughs> the threat came from down here. So the fly was flying, and then it, it noticed a threatening stimulus, and it moved away. How long? I just. Order of magnitude. How long do you think that took? I, I haven't told you how slowed down that movie is, but it was slowed down significantly. How long did it take the fly to notice the threat and fly away? Fractions of a second. So OK, we're, so we're less than a second. How, how many milliseconds? One millisecond's a little fast, even. 10, yeah, 10, 100. How many for 10? How many for 100? Oh, great. I've convinced you all that biology is awesome. OK, so it's, it's around the 10 millisecond range. It takes about 40 milliseconds for this fly to do that. And it turns out that that is too darn fast. It's too fast. So it, the, this fly, if it's going to do this turn to fly away, it can't just do something random. Because what will happen? You're flying. You will fall out of the sky. And if you want to turn, we learned from jet fighter pilots that if, you wanted to, if you're flying this way and you want to go that way, you don't do this. You could do that, like, like some cartoon plane. But what do you do instead? You bank, right? And then you go like this. So you make a bank and a counterbank turn. If we're, OK, so we're physicists. If you do this, and you don't adjust any of this, you fall out of the sky. You slide right out of the sky. So this has to be a highly controlled maneuver. So the fly can't just, can't just go like willy-nilly. It has to know where it's going, and it has to control its, its flight at that time. And the sort of gyroscopes it has on the back here of its, behind its wings come in 20 milliseconds later. Its visual feedback, if it were just waiting for those lags we talked about, would be 30 milliseconds later. And this whole thing is done in 40 milliseconds. So this whole green area, we hypothesize there's prediction happening. We hypothesize where it's happening in the fly visual system. And we found out that that, that seems to be true. And we make a prediction that we want uh, we, we got it down to like a particular kind of synapse in the fly brain that if you knock it out, you shouldn't be able to do this. So we were very happy to say that this um, idea about looking at prediction in the fly brain could let us, could let us dig in further. All right, I'm going to stop talking to you about science there. There are details. There's, there's like the wiring diagram. They're sitting near the bound. And you have to have this particular signal that, you know, you, that doesn't make any sense to you. But because um, I, haven't, I haven't actually explained that, that graph. Um, but I want to leave you with a couple of things. First, if you're interested more in biology, for five years I ran a boot camp, Quantitative Methods in Biology for Incoming Students. And it's all on GitHub. Our, my colleague Stefano Alessina, who was my co-director, um, hosted this. So we put everything we have on GitHub. If you would like to know more about what techniques we use in quantitative biology and just get a little, just put a little toe in with real biological data. This has, um, you know, background that you will all be awesome at. Statistics, inference, stochastic processes, and then uh, program, it's all, it's all in R uh, because it's free. And biologists love R. I think physicists love Python. We'll battle it out at some point. Um, but there are real biological data sets that test your knowledge. And then these are all the people that did it and I've been lucky enough to have such a great group. And just to finish, I wanted to say that our group has a lot of fun. We, um, you know, physicists uh, and biologists get along really well. Um, and uh, the, there's a, there's a, I skipped a Palmer in here. I talked about my grandma, but this is my dad, who was an, aeros who was an aerospace engineer until he retired. And uh, when I started working on butterflies, we needed an experimental rig in my theorist group to do that. 
Um, and that's my recent work on the evolution of color vision. And so he uh, made me a Faraday cage that I think is the prettiest Faraday cage. That's me helping him, because I'm the assistant. Um, that, that I think that's the prettiest Faraday cage um, I've ever seen, because of course he had to finish it and make it in cherry. But, <laughs> um, but, and it's got nice copper, copper sides, because we all know why it has copper. Um, uh, so that's where we make our recordings from butterfly eyes. So I just want to say, I ran a little bit over, but thank you so much for your attention today. Oh, this is our this is this is the our lab mascot, and he's in the office all the time. If you are in the area and want to stop by, please come by. Oh, come come over. <laughs> uh, hi, I really enjoyed your talk. I just noticed with the fly thing, um, the whole background behind that. Like, is there something we can do to like beat the flies? You know, like, are they faster than us then? Because. <laughs> It seems like, you know, this whole maneuver goes so fast that that's probably why, you know, the fly swatter doesn't always work. It's, to it's, it's absolutely why the fly swatter doesn't always work. It, it's the same thing that happens when you try to step on a cockroach, too. They're sensing those wind cur you, when you When you go to swat them with a fly swatter or with a newspaper, you're sending a massive amount of air current at them, and they're incredibly sensitive to that. So it turns out that if you, um, if you come from particular angles, like if you can manage to bop them from below, you'll do a really good job or directly from above. Um, but that's the reason there are holes in the fly swatters. So you mix it up and don't give them as much directional information about where you're coming from. But um, it's, a, it's a great question. 40 milliseconds is just too fast for most of this. But um, what you could do is you could, you could design a fly swatter where it uh, produced a threat and then caught them on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> Questions. Uh, so you said you did research with the salamanders' retinas, and also yeah. you're working with butterflies' ones. And I was just wondering if there was any other research with other animals, and if they compared to each other. Yeah. So we um, we actually did a comparative study. Our retina work, where we saw that the the um, neural code was pressed up a against that bound for prediction. We didn't want to just do it in salamanders because you sort of say, well, it could be special for salamanders. So we looked in rats and mice. And uh, yep, we looked in rats and mice so far. Um, and what we've seen is that they're also smushed up against a bound, but for different uh, damping coefficients, basically. So what you decide to be maximally predictive of depends on your visual environment. Um, so we think that we're not going to find that all retinas are predictive of all scenes, but all retinas are predictive of features in their ecological niche that matters to them. So that's what we've been trying to suss out now by taking a massive uh, survey of uh, motion and natural scenes and trying to tie it to your behavior. So just to give you an example, if you're a salamander, you sit in a muddy puddle, and you wait for something to swim in front of your face, like an insect or a little fish, and then you lunge at it. So you just sit and you wait. And then when something stops, you grab it. So you're a very good position estimator. If you're a mouse running through the world, you're running constantly, and you're really worried about something that's going to swoop in and eat you. So velocity turns out to be a very important signal. And you can think about an underdamped versus critically damped versus overdamped situation, and whether position or velocity would matter more for making predictions in that, um, in that environment. And we find that that plays out with salamanders versus rats. So it's a great question. And that was our whole first research plan. So great, you're hired. <laughs> oh, one OK. Going off of that, so do we really know exactly what is the lag humans have? So what is the lag that humans have? So we do know some of that, because it turns out that your retina is close enough to the surface of your, you know, it's, it's not down inside your skull. There's like a you know, hole, your eye socket here. So you can actually measure electrical signals from your retina, and you can estimate some of these lags. So we know that it's similar. We have a lag, too. Um, our lag is um, in some ways even worse. Our heads are bigger, and we have more steps to get to our cortex. Um, those little flies don't even have cortex. They can just bypass stuff and just wire up input to output. 
Um, so we have multiple systems with different lags, but we definitely have lags, and that's why we have to compensate for them. And if you add in, you know, not only how long it takes my visual system to register it, but then how long it takes me to move my arm and do something, if I'm trying to hit that tennis ball, that just added in like another whole tenth of a second. So it can be, you know, a 200, 300 millisecond lag um, before you can make an action in an environment that has moved without, you know, moved, moved, moved along without you. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important. We also do some human stuff too, without eyeballs. <laughs> just, just looking at a screen and you tell me when you saw something.